We, we do have some time for questions. We have a roving microphone. I think, I hope that those two talks between them have given you an insight about how far we've come in understanding how you can start with a lifeless planet with only chemistry and geology and let it run and life emerges. I mean, that's an absolutely amazing thing to have happened. Um, does anybody have a question? There's a gentleman here. Jeremy Court, I wonder if I can ask Matt, uh, the uh, chemistry that he's been describing is all in free solution. But I seem to remember from my early days in thinking about this sort of stuff, uh, that stereochemistry could occur in the way that uh, perhaps is required for this, the D rather than the L forms being preferred, on uh, surfaces, um, for example, clay particles. Have you got any comments to make on the relevance of that to this chemistry? Um, okay, so um, there's been there's been a lot described about particularly clays in in uh, literature in this area. Not all of our chemistry was in solution. We had some solid phase materials. Our crystals are obviously solid material, and that crystal lattice, the, the fact that that was solid, that's what gave us a chiral environment. And that chiral environment then allowed us to amplify an antimeric excess. And we have, I mean, this is, a, is only a small portion of what we do. We utilize processes like that, so phase transitions regularly to um, affect reactions. Um, whether clay specifically is important, we haven't found evidence that it is in our reactions yet. We've, we've looked at clays a number of times, particularly acidic clays, uh, in the hope that they will catalyze certain reactions. I would never rule out minerals. I think minerals must have been present on the early Earth. Um, we will use anything and everything available to us to get through this problem, um, is, is, is all I can say. We haven't yet found that they're essential. We've got through without them to the stage we're at now. Um, but there are some indications clays could be useful for certain things. Any more? Gentleman at the back. Oh, beg your pardon. There's <coughs> another one in this row here. Hello. I was wondering, do archaebacteria, do they have a lot of DNA replication, do they evolve very much, or do you think they've stayed the same since time immemorial? Um, well, they, I mean, the name Archaebacteria initially meant that they were ancient bacteria, um, and we don't really know how old they are. I, I showed you the, 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 the very early branching. That's what we take to be the case. There is disagreement even about that. I mean, there, there, there's a guy called Tom Cavalier-Smith who would argue that the archaebacteria are only 800 million years old and not 4 billion years old. So there's, there's, a, there's a fair amount of uncertainty about a lot of what I actually said. Um, but, but these processes are so central to how a cell operates um, that they don't change very much. These are among the most slow-changing processes. So it's very difficult to explain why it would be so different to the bacteria if it were not simply antiquity. So I, I, I wouldn't say they were older than the bacteria. I would say they simply emerged independently. Um, transcription and translation, as I said, they are basically the same. So there is a puzzle there about why replication should be so different. Uh, and and as, I, as I suggested, I think it may be to do with the structure of the membranes themselves. It is the membranes diverged because the DNA is attached to the membrane and all the replication apparatus is attached to the attachment to the membrane and off it goes. Um, that, that could potentially account for why there's such a deep difference. But once you've got the difference, it's basically sustained throughout what I would say would be close to four billion years, yes. Okay, do we have any questions in the upper gallery? There's one. Right at the very back there. So Nick has sketched out a fascinating scenario involving hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean and high temperatures and proton gradients uh, for the evolution of the very first cells. And Matt sketched out a scenario for the evolution of RNA that involves, if I understand it right, sometimes quite low temperatures and something that's obviously happened at the surface, possibly with sort of 
uh, UV light and freezing involved. Are these compatible at all? I wonder if both of you could sort of say a bit <laughs> about, about that. So, if Nick doesn't mind, uh, I, again, similar evasive answer to, to the clear question. Um, we're not necessarily concerned at this stage with our exact um, geological scenario. We just want to know that we can build, we, we can understand the basic chemistry required to build these things. We want to, we want to get a protocell in our lab. Uh, understanding how that could be situated in geology is, is secondary to that process. Once we have that, we can start to do really interesting evolutionary experiments. Lots of the chemistry I described didn't require UV light. We had this one step at the end, which isn't essential, but is a bonus. So gives you this purification. John Sutherland, one of the collaborators I mentioned, does have a particularly beautiful way of making the two simple aldehydes that I, I, I used in this synthesis by using UV light. So they can convert hydrogen cyanide into those aldehydes very cleanly, very selectively, using copper cyanide um, photochemistry. So again, implicating it twice suggests to us that it's more important. And this is how we define where we would like our processes to occur in geology. The more times we implicate something, the more likely we think that that geological scenario is is, is, is likely for the necessity for, for origins of life. But there's no reason you couldn't come at any of our steps from a slightly different angle. There may be other really beautiful chemistry out there to get to those intermediates. And then you can build those scenarios into our reaction processes. And what we're really interested in is how robust is this chemistry? How likely is it that those chemical feedstocks could feed in? And it does not matter again to us where those come from. If we can access them, then potentially we can do chemistry and this chemistry in that environment. If I may come in as well. I think, um, I mean, there are two ways of seeing this. One of them, you can try and find some way in which it all fits together. And that might actually be the truth of it in the end. It, very rarely in science is one particular hypothesis entirely right and everything else is just wrong. Um, but the only way to really advance science is to test specific hypotheses. And so your question was, are these two scenarios incompatible? And I would say from a hypothesis point of view, yes, they are incompatible. Um, it might turn out that they're not nearly as incompatible as that, but in, in what I'm testing in my little reactor, uh, I'm assuming that UV radiation is not important because these vents are down at the bottom of the sea. Now, plainly, Matt's chemistry is beautiful and it works. And it may turn out to be that that's the only possible way of doing it, in which case I take my hat off to him. Um, but I think it's not the only possible way of doing it. And then that's all mouth on my part. I'd better go away and do it. So, uh, and that's what I'm trying to do, but it's going to take me a long time to get to the same stage where Matt is right now. Um, so one thing which makes me think that you know, different environments tend to come up with a rather similar subset of molecules. So on asteroids and so on in outer space, you tend to find rather similar subsets of amino acids and uh, you know, a, a, a other molecules as well. Now, a, a lot of the specificity that, that Matt was getting at, we don't see that specificity in biology. We, we see it in RNA, but there are something in the order of 300 different nucleotide bases which are used as cofactors in different enzymes. And, and it's quite baffling why there is this variety. Uh, and very often the synthetic pathways to get them involves adding you know, a methyl group, a CH3 group onto this spot there. Why on earth would you waste all that time trying to add a methyl group right there? The, the, I wonder if the origins of a lot of this chemistry is a lot more of a mess uh, it doesn't appeal to chemists. They don't like messes very much. Um, biologists are quite used to dealing with mess. Um, and and I, I, I have a feeling that, 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 you know, so again, Matt was suggesting perhaps membranes came later. I, I find it hard to imagine a scenario in which amino acids and fatty acids are not the easiest things to produce. So you're going to have other, other molecules in there anyway. And so 
it's not easy to have the kind of beautiful, clean chemistry that, that Matt has shown you. Now, he's... <laughs> yeah, I, I would come back at that. I, so, so, so I, I'm not suggesting in, in my final slide that, that the order I presented this was the order it occurred chemically, i.e. RNA came first, and then we built this on, we built that on in that order. That's just an easy way to reduce the problem for ourselves in the lab. Um, I have no problem with membranes being co-formed right alongside RNAs. It will help us out from the start. What I'm saying in that last slide is essentially what, what Nick was alluding to, that chemists generally don't want a complex mixture, and that comes down to how we've learnt to deal with compounds. You purify them and you look at them in isolation. But this isn't a purely chemical problem. This must transition to biology. And what we want to do now is start to build new ways of looking at chemistry to look at more complex mixtures. So we can start to think about those membranes and those gene-forming compounds all coming together at the same time. That inherently, every time you add another subsystem, becomes a more and more and more challenging chemical uh, problem to, to tackle. But don't, there was no specific historical order to my, to my last slide. It was just a way of presenting the problems that, that biology presents to chemistry. Okay, we have another question at the back by the door. Hi. Um, based on what you have sort of uh, postulated in the research here about the conditions which surrounded the origins for life, what other planets and moons would you expect to find that, those conditions on? Well, from, <coughs> if I go first this time, um, from what I was talking about, um, you know, if, if, if the scenario I was depicting is true, and I admit that's a very big if, um, basically all you require is olivine, water, and CO2, and everything else follows naturally from it. So essentially any, any rocky, wet planet um, should produce similar serpentinization systems, you should have similar alkaline hydrothermal vents, you should have hydrogen gas, you should have CO2, you should have thin inorganic barriers between them, the pro natural proton gradients uh, driving that reaction. So, I mean, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful scenario, but there's not very much experimental substance behind it yet. If it's correct, it implies that life could potentially be forming pretty much right across the universe. I think there's something like 40 billion planets in the in the Milky Way alone, potential exoplanets, uh, which are about the same size as the Earth, and, uh, and you know, perhaps life could be forming on all of those. Getting past bacteria to more complex life is a different question. I, yeah, I, I think that's a fantastic question, um, and one I don't have an answer to, but would love an answer to. So basically what we have right now is a, a, a sample size of one. We have one life, one planet where it occurred, that, in terms of science, is an awful sample size. Um, and the FDA wouldn't approve it. <laughs> we, uh, I can't address the question you, you ask because I don't know what, how likely it is we are to have similar chemistries out there, but we are part of a really big collaboration driven by a US organization, the Simons Foundation, to try and understand the statistical likelihood of not only our type of chemistry, but also just life and, and traces of life. So using the data from Kepler, where we found, you know, met not me, where, where people have found uh, huge samples of stars that have planet systems around them in a really very small area of our sky. And the aim now is to use that data along with new data that will hopefully come from space telescopes like James Webb to start assessing a really big sample size of exoplanets to discover what kind of chemistry is potentially occurring based on their atmospheres. And then we can start to build up a statistical model which will tell us so, so much more. But all this is years and years in the making. Um, and right now, all we have is a sample size of one and that is what we work with. Um, okay. Our time is drawing to an end. Uh, exciting times. Uh, a couple of very quick housekeeping notes again. We have two more events coming up. Uh, we have climate change on the 1st of October. We have consciousness on the 22nd in the same venue. Tickets, I believe, are still available for both. Um, 
Before you leave, please, can you complete those questionnaires that we put on your chairs at the beginning? Um, if you complete them, we'll enter you into a draw to win £25 worth of Amazon vouchers, which will be enough to buy all of Nick's books, probably. <laughs> days, I think. Um, and also, please help yourselves to copies of New Scientist on your way out. Um, there is all the paraphernalia out there. Peruse, bye. Thank you for coming, and most of all, thank you to our two brilliant speakers tonight. It's been a round of applause.